Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry, and today we're talking about a new publication that has come out titled 40 Thieves on Saipan, the Elite Marine Scout Snipers in One of World War II's Bloodiest Battles. We're chatting today with the author, Joseph Tukovsky. He wrote the book with Cynthia Kroc. Joseph, thank you for making time and joining us from Chicago today. Well, thank you for the opportunity. You know, what makes this uh, interview so neat is that you actually have a personal connection to this book. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your connection. Well, I first learned about this at uh, my father's funeral, um, that he led this elite platoon on Saipan. Uh, There were only two such scout sniper platoons deployed during World War II, and one was on Tarawa and the other one was on Saipan. And uh, at Dad's funeral, this seemed uh, like a tangent person got up to speak. And uh, he talked about my dad's tenure of mayor during his uh, time growing up. But then also that the first time that he met uh, my father was at uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where this fellow was there at Naval ROTC, and he was just a kid. And Dad was there on the GI Bill, and he stood out because he was old. And um, he told a story about this surly Marine sergeant who was always at these naval ROTC meetings, every inch a Marine, very stoic. And if he ever had occasion to say the fellow's name, he'd just bark it out. But one day he sees this sergeant talking to my dad and they're laughing and they're joking and they're having a good time. And the fellow thought it was a little odd at first, Um, But he didn't think anything of it until he saw it happening a couple more times. And he finally went up to the sergeant and said, excuse me, but how do you know Frank Tukovsky? And he said, that's Lieutenant Tukovsky to you. And when you speak of him, you do it with respect. He was our platoon commander on Saipan when a Japanese tank broke through the lines. We had no weapons to fight it with. And the tank kept on advancing toward our line, and we just all thought we were goners. Uh, Then suddenly out of nowhere, in the corner of my eye, I see the solitary figure standing in this withering fire, shoots a bazooka, disabling the tank and killing the crew inside. That was the lieutenant. He saved my life that day. He saved the life of everyone in the platoon. Every day of my life, from here on as a bonus because of that man. So when you speak of him, do it with respect. You said you found out this part of your father's history at his funeral. How, how did you feel um, realizing that there was this significant part of your father's story that you hadn't been aware of before? Well, it was pretty apparent that he was in the Marine Corps in the Pacific. He was a uh, retired a full bird colonel. Um, But nothing was ever spoken. If my mother would happen to bring up something about Guadalcanal or Tarawa, my father would get uncharacteristically livid about it, that it not be discussed. Um, So that's, it, it, it wasn't surprising that this happened, but just how it came about and how this man and what, what a a sort of a series of circumstances that gave birth to this book. If that man wouldn't have delivered that eulogy, I never would have opened my father's footlocker in the garage where he saved everything. Um, Letters to and from uh, Roxy, his newlywed bride, my mother, were saved in the footlocker, photographs of anonymous men, 
his platoon rosters for Guadalcanal, Tarawa, and Saipan. And one of the names on it was Sergeant William F. Knuppel. And Knuppel had always been this fellow that we'd visit, we'd see every winter when my dad would be in Mesa, Arizona, spending the, the you know, cold winters here in a warmer climate. And Bill was always known as just a Marine buddy. And knowing what I know now, it makes it so much more interesting that whenever he would try to bring up the war and talk about the push into the valley or Don Evans or Martin Dyer, all my dad would have to say is, Bill, those days are over. And he would tacitly comply. And it's funny that at 80 and 90 year old men, they still had the relationship of sergeant and lieutenant. What was your experience um, finding other men who served with your father and documenting their stories in researching this book? Well, fortunately, Bill Knuppel was not like my father. You know, he was a walking, talking encyclopedia of his experience in the Marine Corps from uh, the days on Iceland, which was the first uh, sort of military deployment that uh, we did during World War II. Winston Churchill was constantly asking Roosevelt for help in the war against Germany. And what, what Roosevelt's response was to send the Marine Corps to Iceland to replace British troops who were sorely needed back home for the what they thought to be impending cross-channel invasion by the Nazis. And, um, and that's where my dad and Bill Knuppel first met, was on Iceland. And uh, they served on Guadalcanal and Tarawa, not in the same u uh, unit like a platoon, but uh, they did on Iceland. And Bill just, you know, shared everything with me. He told me stories about, you know, Don Evans and Martin Dyer and Evans' two army buddies, Arello and Dooley, that uh, he and Don Evans, who was a squad leader for the unit, um, well, they had a final liberty in Honolulu right before they were shipping out for Saipan. And Schofield Barracks was there, and Don Evans, the squad leader, knew that his two army buddies were at Schofield Barracks. So he and Bill Knuppel go to find him just to have some drinks and, you know, pal around before they have to ship out. But through the uh, drinking at the local slop shoot, um, they think it's a good idea to go AWOL from the army and join the Marines for the invasion of Saipan. So they smuggle these two guys on board ship. The army uniforms were very similar to a Marine uniforms. They just uh -huh. had to cut off some braid and insignia and add a, you know, a Marine Corps uh, emblem on a hat. And bam, they were Marines. And they smuggled them on board. And uh, um, after a few days at sea, Bill had to go and, you know, probably fess up to Dad what, what had happened. And Dad said, you know, just between you and me, Bill, you never came into my, you know, room. You never told me this. But you make sure that these fellows are armed when we hit the beach. And then he said, no, in fact, it's, this is Don's handiwork. So you make sure Don has those fellows, you know, armed. And then a few hours later, there's an announcement, you know, please check for rifle serial number, blah, blah, blah. It's missing. And then the next day, the same thing, you know, happened with another rifle missing. And Don, uh, my dad sought out Knuppel and I said, Don's been busy. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Knuppel shared a lot of those memories. And, you know, with, with what he told me, it prompted me to go through the roster and find out who else might be alive from the platoon. What was the reaction when you reached out to these these? Marines and and told them you wanted to hear their story. You know, I you know one of the things that the fellows said um, was that you know you spend your whole life trying to forget, but you relive it every day for the rest of your life. 
And I think perhaps in younger times, they wanted to forget it. But when they start to have their mortality more in front of them, and they're little old men, and they don't want to be remembered as little old men, uh, they were much more willing to share their stories with me, especially when I you know, was well armed with intimate details of the platoon that only another platoon member would know. I think that sort of made me a, a buddy by proxy. Um, like the Pigros, there was an episode on Hawaii where they knew they'd be shipping out soon and dad wanted to do something special for his men. So he took them to the beach for a pig roast, but they didn't have any things. So they went out and stole a pig from a Japanese farmer on Hawaii, which was highly illegal <laughs> to do, you know, to steal domesticated animals. But uh, they got away with it and they had a really lovely time at the beach. In fact, and I only know about, I can verify that because there is a letter that my father wrote home to Roxy, his young bride, about he had a barbecue for his, his boys today. <laughs> so, so it was, uh, they were, you know, knowing the information that uh, Knuppel provided me uh, made it much more easy for me to ask them pointed questions as opposed to just, you know, what did you do in the war kind of broadness. Well, we're chatting today with Joseph Tukovsky. He's the author of the book, 40 Thieves on Saipan, the Elite Marine Scout Snipers in one of Saipan's bloodiest battles. It's written with Cynthia Kroc. And we'll be back with more after this break. October is Humanities Month, and the Northern Marianas Humanities Council invites you to Humanities Fridays, a webinar series featuring local and regional humanities scholars and practitioners. That's every Friday in October at both 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. Visit our website at nmhcouncil.org for more information and to register for an event that interests you. That's nmhcouncil.org. Welcome back to Your Humanities Half Hour. We're talking about the book 40 Thieves on Saipan, the elite Marine Scout Snipers in one of World War II's bloodiest battles. And uh, the book is now available on Amazon, Books A Million, Barnes and Noble. And we're speaking with the author and son of one of these platoon members, Joseph Tukovsky. Joseph, can you share with us a little bit of um, the story of what happened in Saipan uh, with this platoon? Sure. Sure. Um, well, it was a very bold move in the War of the Pacific. Uh, it was thousands of miles beyond any other Allied situation. And at the, ti uh, at the time, Saipan was a Japanese home island. And the first link in the home islands that would lead to Tokyo. And there were two assets um, in the Marianas that were of great importance to the Allies. And that was Isleto Airfield on uh, Saipan and the Ushi Airdrome on Tinian. And I can actually which... I can actually see Aslito Airfield from where we're doing this interview today. Oh, it's wow. practically <laughs> in my backyard. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, that's it's it's, it's, it's wonderful to be speaking with someone from there. Um, and um, the the runways were large enough to accommodate the B29 super fortresses that would put Tokyo right. in reach, which would help to speed the end of the war as opposed to these grueling island hoppings that they had been doing so far. Um, so that was the importance of, of uh, Saipan. And in fact, in uh, a very often General Saito, who um, was the commander of the garrison there, referred to Saipan as Hirohito's treasure. Mm. Um, and there were plans, knowing that the, at some point the Allies might invade Saipan, um, there were plans put in motion to fortify the island, but it was such a surprise that we launched the attack so early that it took Japan off guard and they weren't able to fortify it the way um, they did places like Tarawa. Are there any particular um, parts of the story that stand out um, to you personally? And have you ever been to Saipan? Yet. No, I haven't. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah. 
Well, this is um, our invitation we'll to, to you. Oatmeal when I, when we'll have to eat oatmeal <laughs> together when I, when I visit. <laughs> well, hopefully we can get you something better than that when you come. But right. imagining the island and, and, the, and the stories that you collected, the documentation, is there any particular part of that story that stands out to you that you would look forward to seeing that spot when you come? Well, they're the, the, uh, in collecting all of the stories from these men, there would be, it would be like a big jigsaw puzzle where someone might contribute the beginning of a story, somebody else the middle and the other part the end. And in fact, it's where the book begins when we finally figured out how to begin the book. Um, and that was on a day when a, a squad about 10 men from the platoon walked into an ambush. And it was when they were trying to conquer Tipo Pale. And uh, the scout snipers, also known as the 40 Thieves, were sort of the, the elite of the elite. They were the rough and tumble guys who would go and do anything that another Marine company or platoon couldn't accomplish. And on this day, which was June 22nd of 1944, they were sent to clean out some machine gun nests on a road that snaked its way up the side of Tipo Pale. Um, a, a, a whole company of Marines, about a hundred and some men, was virtually decimated with 80 casualties when they walked into this ambush. So the, the hierarchy, General James Risley, decided to send the scout snipers in, 40 of them, to clean out this pocket of resistance. And uh, on that, they were involved in a three and a half hour long firefight, trying to um, clean up the pocket of resistance. They were unsuccessful. Uh, another company went in the next day to clean out the pocket, and they were unsuccessful. Wow. So they decided that the area would be bypassed. But in the 40 Thieves' attempt to clean it out, one uh, squad of them, about eight of the 10 men, were either killed or wounded on that day. Mm -hmm. And one of them was Don Evans, um, the squad leader, and one of his high school chums. Um, died in that ambush with two others, I believe. You said when we were chatting before the show is that one of the things you hope people will get from the book is a better understanding of what veterans go through when they go off to war and when they come back. Um, how do you feel your father's experience shaped him as a person as you remember him? Well, being the, the leader, um, and having everybody look up to him of his, his boys. Um, it, it obviously changed him. He's the one who said, there, every, every chapter leads with a sort of a salient quote, uh, mostly by the men. And he said, uh, uh, my, my brother had this wonderful uh, ability to put photo albums in front of my parents and then record their commentary so there was one time when he was looking back at a picture of maybe one of his men, I don't know. He said, you know, no guy is ever the same when he comes home from war. It changes a person. The loss of an arm or a leg you can learn to live with, but the loss of your soul is something you may never recover. How do you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and that's, and that was pretty much the theme with all of these, you know, older men and the nightmares that they continue to have to their death. Um, uh, one of the fellows in the platoon that I was fortunate enough to meet, they became almost like surrogate parents for me, Bob Smots and his wife, Alma Jean. Uh, they actually met when they were 14 years old at an Alice Chalmers tractor show in Oklahoma. <laughs> And they got married the minute he came home from war. And when I had been visiting them for a few times, uh, she took me aside and said how good it was that Bob had somebody to talk to about this because he'd never sent 
said anything to anyone about it his whole life. And he was telling me stories. About, I'll get to one in a second. But then she said, um, you know, uh, when we were first married, um, I frequently wake up at night to Bob choking me because he was having one of his nightmares. He saw his buddy Daniel Kenny get killed. And then he started chasing the Japanese through the elephant grass and he'd catch one. And then they'd start to engage into hand-to-hand -hand combat. And that's his nightmare. He told me that his nightmare isn't in the book because it actually happened in the book. Um, and, you know, how, how as an 18 year old girl or 19 year old girl, what are you, what are you gonna think? Uh, so many of these men went through a litany of wives when they came home after the war. Um, one of the fellows in the platoon, Wild Bill Emmerich, who was a club fighter out of Chicago, was married and had a child uh, back home. And when he returned home, at some point after a month, she and the child left like a thief in the night, changed their names and were never heard from again. And that's, and that's what happens to these people, uh, men and women, and it's no different for those who serve our country today or any member of any armed force anywhere. Um, you know, when you're involved in that life and death struggle, um, it haunts you for a long, long time. You also mentioned earlier that one of the things that you're doing with this book is um, donating a portion of the proceeds to veterans organizations. Can you share with us a little bit about that? Sure. My dad would, would always lament that we don't do enough for our veterans. And obviously, and you know, oddly enough, um, all of the little old guys that I would interview echoed that same sentiment. So to honor their, their sentiment, um, I determined that if we were fortunate enough to get the book published, that a significant portion of the royalties would be donated to organizations that help um, our veterans. Um, because I feel as I'd be a sad excuse of a son if I didn't, didn't uh, you know, honor my father in that way. You mentioned this story by uh, Mr. Smots that you wanted to share. Well, this goes back to their uh, earning the nickname of the 40 Thieves. It, actually, that was one of the first discoveries I made before I even thought about writing the book. Um, was one of the, um, I googled my dad's name and Silver Star and up popped this Marine Corps website that had an article from the December 1944 issue of Leatherneck Magazine that was entitled, Tchaikovsky's Terrors. Okay. And below, below the article was this little text, and it uh, uh, was submitted by a Chris Tipton. And it said, this was my father's platoon during World War II, and everything in it is true, except they were never known as terrors. They were known as Ski's 40 Thieves. So even before I had thought about writing a book, the, the title was staring me in the face. But... Um, Marines during World War II were all notorious thieves because they were the poorest equipped branch of service. Um, in fact, when they first went into Guadalcanal to uh, do battle with the seasoned Imperial Army that had been in combat for almost a decade, um, they were equipped with uniforms, rations, and weapons that were left over from World War I. And by the time Tarawa rolled around, though, they were starting to get some of the newer equipment. But all they had to take on the Imperial Army was a 1903 Springfield bolt-action rifle with a six-cartridge uh, six, um, clip. Um, and that's a and hand grenade, and that's what they had to, to do battle. So being uh, thieves in general... Obviously, these fellows excelled at the craft, besides stealing the pig um, <laughs> for the pig roast. Um, there was also an episode where they stole an army colonel's jeep. Okay. And I'm reading, ab I'm reading about this in, first of all, Bill Knuppel told me that a buddy of his wrote a book. And I thought, oh, yeah, who doesn't write a book, you know, like me? 
And, uh, but it turned out to be Leon Uris. And Leon Uris was Bill Knuppel's buddy for the Battle of Tarawa. And uh, his first book was called Battle Cry, and it was his remembrance of his time as a Marine, but all of the names were fictionalized. You know, General Holland Mad Smith was somebody else. You know, Colonel Murray was High Pockets. Uh, Admiral Nimitz had a different name. So every, everything was changed a little bit, but in the book, after I read it first, because, he, you know, Knuppel told me about it, so I read it. In the book, he writes about this group of notorious thieves that's in, you know, the 6th Marine Regiment. And they're nicknamed the Foxes or something like that. And uh, I read it and I'm thinking, well, this can't be it because it was a whole company of, mm -hmm. of Marines. And, but there is an episode in it where they steal an army colonel's Jeep. So I, I asked Knuppel, you know, do you know anything about the Jeep? And he said, no, no, no. And I said, well, is this, is this group you? And he said, somewhat, you know. So then I kept on asking all of the guys, and finally, I, I end up with Bob Smots, and I said to him, Did, was there ever a time when you guys stole an Army colonel's Jeep? And he said, no. And at that point, I was deflated. You know, it was, it was strike four, really, for asking all of the guys. And, but, he, but he went on to say, it was an Army captain's Jeep. <laughs> and we beat the hell out of that thing. You know, and nowadays when you think about snipers and, and things like that, you think about them getting special training, but your description of like what they went to war with, I can imagine, I mean, did they have any special training or were they oh, just, they, you know, flying by the seat of their pants and their natural talent? No, you know, this, this platoon was sort of a, a precursor to what we know now as today as possibly Green Berets. Oh. Um, they were unique to the Marine Corps in that they were trained to live and work behind enemy lines for days at a time. Mm. Um, besides getting the modern technology of the day of a unertal scope on their 1903 Springfields, that made the raf rifle accurate, I think, I think to within an inch up to a mile. Whoa. And what was interesting, and this is what Bob said, is when you're, you're sniping, a, a, a bullet travels like a football pass. So the farther the target is away, the higher you have to aim over it. So if something is, you know, say a mile away, you might have to aim a city block up in the air to get it to drop down onto the target. No way. And then there's... All of the other, uh, th those might be incorrect distances, but that's sort of the crux of it. You have to mm -hmm. aim really high and the bullet drops down on its target. And that anything, humidity, wind, even your heartbeat can affect, you know, how you're sniping. He was saying this about some claims about a sniper who hit a target at some extreme distance away. And he said, that's just, it, it would have to be sheer luck that it fell upon the target, be knowing all of those things and how difficult it is to hit a target from far away. But uh, all Marines were, were always excellent marksmen and uh, the unertal scopes that they were um, issued were only good for the first day because in the second day, humidity had uh, gotten inside the scopes and rendering them useless. But doing what they were going to be doing, working behind enemy lines, mapping enemy positions, um, they learned demolitions. They learned how to read maps, to make maps from memory, um, to sketch positions. Um, and then they also learned silent killing techniques because being so far behind enemy lines where firing a weapon would be your last resort. Um, they learned to kill, as Bill Knuppel told me, in ways that you can't even fathom, which made their war a little more up close and personal. A little bit different from today, not in all circumstances, but certainly more hand-to-hand -hand combat. Right. Uh, you know, prior to them, any hand-to-hand -hand combat they would experience would be in the frenzied bonsais. Mm -hmm. um, and there were three um, at least three major ones on Saipan um, that they had to fend off 
you know, with using whatever is available. You know, it could be a rifle as a, as a club. It could be uh, an entrenching tool. Um, but, you know, being stealth behind enemy lines, they'd also travel at night, much like the Japanese. They learned to fight like the Japanese. Um, traveling at night and, you know, doing, uh, learning how to hide and conceal themselves as troops would march by, how to, how to count the number of troops that might be passing by by the, counting the footfalls. Mm. And um, they were trained in a, in a very specific way for the um, three months prior to landing on Saipan. Um, prior to this, there had been some scout sniper schools set up back in the United States, you know, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. But um, all these guys had to learn their lessons on the job, pretty much. Really an extraordinary story, and even more so because of your personal connection to it. How do you feel writing this book has shaped you as a person or influenced you? Well, it certainly... Uh, you know, I wanted to write it in a way where it wasn't just a book with characters. The first half of the book is developing these men and having you get to know the men. Um, so we are able to salt in letters that were written home and letters that were received from as part of the storyline because um, I felt it was important knowing, you know, what these men gave up, you know, as that title in the famous movie goes, the best years of their lives. Um, I wanted, you know, the reader to fall in love with Don Evans, with all of these guys, Bill Knuppel, my father, either as, you know, brothers or sons or husbands or boyfriends, so that when they are killed or wounded, it's just that much more impactful. Um, and, uh, you know, when one of the fellows dies is one of the scenarios where the story is provided by two different people, Marvin Strombo, who uh, bunked next to Corporal Martin Dyer, another squad leader. Um, and they bunked on a journey from uh, Hawaii to Saipan. And on the last night before landing, uh, Dyer confesses that he had a dream, uh, a premonition, a waking dream, where he saw his name on a cross on Saipan and that he was going to die. And Marvin tried to talk him out of it. And uh, he said, no, Saipan is as far as I go. So then the story picks up uh, when he's being sent out on this mission and Marvin is watching Dyer from a distance and how Dyer just, it's one of those sort of mystical things you hear from men who've served or women who've served in the war that um, a voice tells them something like duck and they duck and a bullet zips past. It was the same thing where he's looking at Martin Dyer and it's not him. He's a ghost image of himself. And as Dyer leaves to go out onto the mission, he sort of gives a little salute to Strombo. And he didn't think Strombo, he was talking to Strombo, but he looked around and, and, and Dyer pointed directly at him and said, no. And Marvin understood that he was saying goodbye. And then that night, another one of the fellows, uh, Roscoe Mullins from West Virginia, picks up the ending of the story when Dyer gets caught in some machine gun fire and his body is just riddled with bullets. And it was uh, Tipton, Chris Tipton's dad, who was actually working on him, tearing the sulfa packets, putting it on the wounds. And as Roscoe said, said the night got so quiet you could hear the sound of Tipton tearing the packets and the powder hitting the wounds and then the gurgling and the bubbling of the blood. And the only other thing you could hear that night was Dyer calling out for his mother until you couldn't hear that anymore. 
The name of the book is 40 Thieves on Saipan, the elite Marine Scout snipers in one of World War II's bloodiest battles. We've been chatting today with the author, Joseph Tukovsky, who wrote the book with Cynthia Kropp. Joseph, thank you so much for your time and most especially for honoring the men whose stories are contained in this book. Oh, thank you, Catherine. I appreciate it. Any final thoughts before we go today? Just uh, would love to visit Saipan sometime and uh, on my way there to stop in Hawaii because that's where a lot of the men are buried. There was a cemetery on Saipan um, and then all of them were moved to this place in the Pacific that's now known as the Punch Bowl. And Don Evans is there and Martin Dyer is there and some other fellows from the book. And uh, I've been uh, fortunate enough to visit a lot of their graves and I always pour them a little bourbon and leave a little sprig of rosemary for remembrance to let them know they're not forgotten. Thank you again. Thank you. This has been Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Kathleen Perry. This program was supported by a We the People grant awarded to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Mm -hmm.